so the Apostle Paul would agree with that song because he wrote in Philippians chapter 2 that the Father has given to Jesus a name that is above every other name. And our celebration at Christmas time will be to focus on some of his names. Next Sunday, we'll study that word, that name, Emmanuel, which means God with us. In two weeks, we'll talk about the name given to him, the name of Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And then Christmas Eve, in our morning services, we're going to look at one of my favorites. He will be called a Nazarene. I want to explain to you why he will be called a Nazarene. But for this morning, I want you to grab your Bibles and come with me to John chapter 1. And we're going to study one of the most significant names of Christ that John gave to him in John chapter 1. If you don't have a Bible, there should be one in the pew in front of you. Please feel free to join us in the Gospel of John. I want to read the first five verses and then... Verses 14 through 18. While you're turning there, let me remind you that the incarnation of Jesus Christ is the central doctrine of the Christian faith, and it is the doctrine that gives us the hope we have in Jesus Christ. Keep in mind, will you, when you study the Gospel of John, that 90% of what John wrote or said does not exist in the rest of the Gospels. So John has a very unique purpose and a very unique goal in how he writes. So in the other three synoptic Gospels, you have the earthly Christmas story, the details of what happened when Christ came to the earth. In John's Gospel, you have a unique perspective of the coming of the Son of God in its heavenly origin or its supernatural aspect. So you have the earthly stories in the other Gospels, but John gives us the heavenly story about who Jesus is when he came. And I want to read for you John's Christmas account in John chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. In the beginning was the, what is it? Word. Word. That's a name and title for Jesus Christ. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life. Are there any Zoe's in the room? That's the Greek word, Zoe. Zoe means life. In him was life, Zoe. And the life was the light of men. I just love this. Watch. The light shines in darkness. His light He's the light of the world. He shines in darkness, and the darkness cannot overcome it. Now jump down to verse number 14. And the word that he's introduced to us in verse 1 became flesh, flesh and blood, and he dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This is he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's right side, he has unveiled him, he has revealed him, he has shown him to us. So John introduces us to the supernatural side of the Christmas story. So if you worship God without understanding the supernatural side of Christmas, you're just observing some really cool traditions. If you miss John's point about who we worship and why we worship, you've missed the whole point of Christmas. So let me just show you a couple of things that I help, hope will help you understand who it is that we're worshiping. Number one, his name says it all. He's been given a unique name, and that name is the Word of God. In the beginning was the Word. It's that very familiar Greek word, logos. Um, it, it's an ancient word, really. It belonged to the Greeks. Uh, it, is, it, is in, it, it appears in ancient Greek literature about the 5th and 6th century B.C., so it's been around for a really long time. It actually began as a mathematical term and slowly evolved to giving the whole account of a story. So the Hebrews adopted it into their language 
And in the mindset of a Hebrew, when they used the word logos or its synonyms, they weren't just talking about the word that is spoken. They're talking about the word that is spoken with all of its meaning. So to understand the title logos, you have to understand the uniqueness of that word is God saying, I'm speaking through Christ, the Son of God. But there's more to it. And that is, the word not only refers to Jesus Christ himself, as is very clear in the text, it refers to the message and the meaning for why he came to the earth. So there are lots of people that recognize the value of the name of Jesus, but they don't necessarily understand why God gave him and what he's trying to say. Do you understand what he's trying to say? Are you listening that has to be part of the point of that word. If God chooses the name Logos or the word for Jesus, it must mean, I hope the world is listening. He chooses a unique word and says, how are you listening? Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they know me and they follow me. So we're listening to what God is saying to us through the Logos of God, the word of God. But it's more than just his name, it's the message behind what he's trying to say to us. So the word basically means that Jesus is the total message, the full embodiment and the final and complete revelation of God himself. Jesus is the full and final word from God revealing who he is and the need of humanity. So I wondered if when I was reading this text, uh, like me, you were thinking about another book in the Bible, the first chapter of the Bible, the book of Genesis. When you read John chapter 1, you can't help but think back to some of what was happening in, John, in, in Genesis chapter 1, where we're given the account of the creation of the world and of mankind. And we read, in the beginning, God. John says, in the beginning was the word. So he's painting a picture for us. And I may be getting ahead of myself just a little bit, but don't miss his point. There are so many similarities between John 1 and Genesis 1. So in Genesis 1, we're told that the earth before God intervened was, uh, was without form, it was a void, and darkness covered the earth. So we're introduced somewhat to a chaotic picture. And then Genesis 1, 3 says, And God said, the disorder and the chaos of the world before God created it was interrupted by God speaking into the world. I'll come back here in a moment. But that's John's point. Jesus is God speaking to us in our need. So the first covenant reference reminds us of the power of the word of God to create life. John wants us to realize that Jesus Christ is also creating life. Getting ahead of myself, but let me remind you too of how the book of Hebrews uses this same idea. Listen carefully to what the writer says about how God is speaking to the world today. Long ago, at many times, and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. So here's the progressive revelation of what God wants the world to know. He speaks to the world through the prophets. Now, in these last days, this New Testament era, the way God speaks and spoke is through his son. Watch this. In these last days, he's spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. So John uses the term to say, Jesus is the full and complete and final revelation of God to the world. You want to know God? You have to go through Jesus. You have to understand who he is. You say, this is tough going, Derek. Hang in there with me. Because your eternal life depends upon it. You can't say you know God or you worship the Christ of Christmas until you know who he is. 
And this text is telling us who he is. He's God's full and final and complete revelation to the world. By the way, I'm still thinking about that title. His, that word says it all. Uh, this word is God's final word to the world. Watch this carefully, church family. The world doesn't get the final say. It may feel like the world has chosen a path of its very own, but it will be brought into account. Listen carefully, because in Revelation chapter 19, John has a vision of the future, the future appearing of Jesus Christ in his glorious second coming. And he says, I saw the heaven open, behold, a white horse, and the one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, crowns, and he has a name written that no one knows but he himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. This is God saying to the world, you don't get the final say. The sun will come back and bring all things into judgment and into account one day. And and when he's revealed, he'll be revealed as the word of God. God spoke in the creation of the world. God spoke in the progressive revelation of his son so that we could know the way to salvation. And he will speak in the end. So... Let me make an application for you. There can be no such thing as a Christian apart from the Word of God. Both the written Word of God, the Bible, and the living Word of God, Jesus. The written Word of God, the Bible you have in your lap, is a unique book because the Bible says of itself in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12, the Word of God is living and active and sharper than a two-edged sword. You can't be a Christian without the seed of this word planted in your heart, watered by the Holy Spirit that brings you to eternal life, to faith. And you got to know that I love my Bible. It is one of my dearest friends. I have found I can't get through life without feeding my hungry soul upon the words of God. And Jesus said, you can't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. This word of God is an anchor to my soul. But watch carefully. This written word was given to reveal the living word. Jesus, we don't worship our Bible. We worship the God who came in the flesh, whose name is Jesus. Emmanuel, the Nazarene, the Savior of the world, the Lamb of God. He's the living word, isn't he, that that we worship. That's why Jesus said, if you abide in me and my word abide in you, my words abide in you, you shall ask anything that you wish and it will be given to you by the Father. What a promise. So abiding in Jesus means that his word must be abiding in me. What a wonderful name is Jesus. The other gospel accounts choose similar or or different names. John says he's the word who became flesh. Let me show you the second thing in the text. His credentials are out of this world. This passage was written to assure God's people that in the coming of Christ, God himself stepped into fallen humanity. You tracking with me, church family? Somebody say, we're tracking, Derek. Say, keep preaching, Derek. You got to understand what I'm saying. John is making it very clear that this word is the eternal God. The same God that is detailed in Genesis 1. He's equal with the Father in every way. So the text says, in the beginning was the word. For those of you who don't know, I'm sure many of you do, there are three famous beginnings in the Bible. The first is the beginning of the world and the creation of the world by God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. There's the famous beginning of Jesus Christ in his earthly ministry, written about by John in his first letter, that which was from the beginning, which we have seen and heard, which we have handled with our own hands, the word of life. It's the beginning of his earthly life as he sojourned among us. 
then there is what theologians call in John chapter 1 the famous unbeginning beginning. It's a reference to the fact that Jesus Christ was the eternal God who became a man and stepped into time and space for a particular purpose. But don't miss what the text is telling us. This text is telling us exactly what Jesus Christ himself said. Before Abraham was, I am. You know that the Pharisees were so ticked at Jesus, they crucified him for it. And they were ticked for two reasons. He said he existed before Abraham. Abraham existed 3,000 years at least before Jesus Christ walked the earth. So Jesus was saying, I am eternal. But the second reason that they got really angry at him is because he said, I am. The name by which Jehovah God revealed himself to Israel when they needed to be led out of slavery in Egyptian bondage. Moses said, whom shall I say sent me? What will, what will I tell the people? And, and the, the, the Lord said, tell them, the I am has sent you. I can't tell if you're tracking with me or not. You got to hear what I'm saying today. If your Christmas is going to mean anything to you at all, at some point it must dawn on you and overwhelm you that this baby in a manger is the eternal God in flesh, in human flesh and bones. And so our tradition should be marked by the deepest reverence, the highest worship, and the greatest gratitude that a man could give to God because there's something very unique about him. John layers his argument, by the way. If you read this passage, you'll say, sounds like he said that before, but he's saying something slightly new because that's exactly what he's doing. He's laying his, layering his argument to reinforce that I can't, you can't miss who it is that we worship at Christmas time. So he's the eternal God, and then he said the word was with God, and he repeats it again in verse number two, which is to say he's the eternal God, and he coexisted with Jehovah throughout all eternity in the blessed Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So do you remember just prior to Jesus being arrested, he met with his disciples and the upper room discourse and he was giving them some final counsel and getting ready for the days that are ahead and the separation that would come and the coming of the Holy Spirit. And Philip interrupted him and said, Lord, we'll be happy if you just show us the Father. To which Jesus said, Philip, have I been with you so long and yet you don't get it? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Because I am the Father, he said in John chapter 10, are one. Jesus is the invisible God who is a spirit revealing himself to humanity that we might be reconciled to him. Listen to me carefully. He layers his argument about the true identity of Jesus and his credentials are out of this world. And he said, not only is he the eternal God who existed with the Father in eternity past, he's also the same God who created the world. John says there's nothing that exists that was not created by him. So we worship him as the creator God. I love this. I think I pause when we're reading this. Not only is the, the God who said, uh, let, let, let the continents part and be filled with water. He's the God who spoke. But this text says he is the life giving God. He's the source of life. Again, that's reminiscent of Genesis chapter 1, isn't it? It is God who created life. He created physical life. He breathed into man a living soul, and man became a living creature. We sinned against God, and we, the, the sentence of death was passed judiciously upon all humanity. And in our spiritual death, we've been separated from God. That's the story of Genesis. The story of John is that in our spiritual death, Jesus Christ has come to breathe new life into we who were separated from God and dead in our trespasses and sins. God the Father spoke, breathed life into that first man and woman. Now Jesus Christ says, what you forfeited in the garden, I've come back to give you all over again. Spiritual life, eternal life. Reconciliation with God. 
At the moment of salvation, a great miracle takes place in your life. Life overtakes death and makes you a new creation in Christ Jesus. And the source of life is Jesus. He is is the source of life. He is your hope. I'm trying to hurry along here because some of you look like you want me to hurry. (laughs) Let let me show you that before I move on to my third and final point, in verse number five, five, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome it. Jesus Christ is not only the eternal God who coexisted with the Father in eternity past, who created the world and is the source of eternal life in the gift of salvation, he is also the light of the world. And for all the darkness that there is on this planet, and there's lots, isn't there? My wife and I have been taking a sabbatical from watching the news. It's so depressing. Every day our hearts are broken by some absurd story of violence and rape and insanity around the world. The darkness is booming. But listen to me carefully. The darkness will never extinguish the light of the eternal Son of God. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. And as hard as as hard as times are going to get for the world, and they're coming, we don't fear the darkness. I can't help but think about my early life as a boy and then a teenager. I was a pot-smoking, wine-guzzling, crazy kid living on his own. I will never forget after I became a follower of Jesus Christ and I had a Bible and I started reading John chapter 1 and I read that all the darkness in my human heart cannot overcome, extinguish, and silence the light of Jesus Christ. And I will be eternally grateful that the deep beams of darkness in my soul cannot be owned, excuse me, cannot destroy me, but can be overcome through Jesus Christ. So I think if you're struggling with personal darkness, Jesus is the light who will lead you to God. Because the Bible says God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Jesus is the light that leads us to the light. But watch this carefully. There's also a lot of darkness in our culture. I heard a report this past week from Carson Pugh, who is one of the leading attorney, uh, excuse me, attorneys representing Trinity Western University from British Columbia before the Supreme Court of Canada. The Supreme Court of Canada is on the verge of making a decision that a Christian university may not stand on its biblical values. It will be silenced and their right to grant a law degree will be removed because they will not agree with the deeply liberal agenda of our world. Carson Pugh sent out a plea for pastors across Canada to pray. He said they were tough, two tough days because they were clearly in the minority before the Supreme Court of Canada. And the voices that are clamoring to silence the teaching of marriage And the word of God are stronger and greater in our land. As I listened to Carson's report, I felt the darkness crouching in on my mind. I felt it pushing in on my heart and saying, Oh God, my beloved land of Canada where we grew up, quoting scripture at the beginning of every day in public school and saying the Lord's Prayer. Now he may not even be mentioned. And Christians who claim to be followers of Christ in Canada will be passed over for a job or a degree or for a promotion. But we take solace in this glorious reminder that this light of Jesus Christ will never be extinguished, silenced, or put out. And we better get ready for hard days because we are also, Jesus said, you are the light of the world. We need to be those examples. I'll just touch on this briefly, okay? Uh, I want you to see thirdly in this text, his mission is to die for. 
His name says it all, and his credentials are out of this world, and his mission is to die for. In language that highlights salvation history, John tells us the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and he brought the second piece to salvation history, the salvation history puzzle. The first piece was given by God from Moses in the receiving of the law. So God was revealing his plan to the world through Moses and the law. Jesus Christ is the full and complete and final word of God. And what did he bring? Grace and truth. The two things you need the most and you must have to be saved. You cannot have eternal life without truth and grace. You have to know what the Bible teaches about your sinful condition about your inability to save yourself and about his willingness to come and to die as your sacrifice, a substitute for your sin upon the cross. You have to know that the Bible teaches you have to take one more step to be a Christian. And where does that truth come from? From God's word. But what I love about this text is God doesn't just speak the truth. He presents himself among us Do you see that in the passage? That's the word of God. God speaks to us, and then he comes to tabernacle, to journey, to live in flesh and blood among us. Why did he do that? Because his mission wasn't just to die on the cross. Jesus had a mission of saying, can we be friends? Hi, I'm Derek. What's your name? Cheryl. Cheryl. (laughs) Yes, I know who you are, Cheryl. Didn't recognize you with your glasses on. (laughs) So Cheryl, I didn't come just to save you. I came to befriend you and to reconcile you to God. He came with the truth and he came with grace. There's not a lot of grace around, by the way. Have you had one of those police officers who pulls you over for speeding and you plead for grace? (laughs) No, sorry, here's your ticket. I've asked for grace. Hey, I don't speed very often. Do you have it in your heart to forgive me and just give me a warning? No, no, no. God says your sin deserved the wrath of God. It deserved punishment. It did. We earned it. But he says my grace is I forgive you and I restore you to fellowship with God. And so his mission was to complete God's plan to fulfill the story of salvation. The reason we celebrate Jesus and worship Jesus is because he is the medium by which God has fulfilled his heart for lost mankind. His mission was to bring grace and truth to your heart, and it is his grace and truth alone that will set you free. Truth shall set you free, you know. But I said to someone the other day, hold on, the Bible doesn't say the truth shall set you free. The Bible says you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Say, I don't understand. There are some people that make up their own truth in their mind. That's not setting you free. You must know the truth that the Bible teaches about the way to God and the coming of the Holy Spirit and the source of power for us to live as Christians is not within us, but is a gift from the Holy Spirit. So just uh, let me complete this text by asking you to look back at verse number 10, will you? Here's how John applies the gospel story to us. In verse 10, he's talking about Jesus. He, Jesus, was in the world, and the world was made through him. (laughs) Yet the world didn't know him. The creator walked the planet, and people ignored him. Spit in his eye and rejected him. Then he goes on to say, not only that, he came to his own people, the Jews, And his own people did not receive him. It wasn't just the Jews who rejected Jesus. It was the whole world. Watch this carefully now, though. But to all that will receive him, to them he gives the right to become the children of God, even to those who believe in his name. The last part of the salvation story is that you must stop rejecting Jesus and receive him into your heart. But receive him as the God that he is. 
as the Lord who alone can absolve you of your sin and, and forgive you of your breaking his law. And so the last step is, I open my heart, Lord. I remember the day I did that. It's a 17 year old boy. I said, I'm in a big, I was in a big mess. I just got the boot out of my family. I broke into an abandoned home and laid under an open window and looked out at the star that night in an August night and started talking to God because I knew I had one last hope. And I'd heard about this wonderful Jesus. And I, say, I, I remember looking up at the, the empty sky and begin praying to God. Something, I opened my heart. I need you. Become my savior. Save me from my sins. I'm already a slave to sin at 17 years of age. I wanted to be set free. And he saved me gloriously. And he's waiting to do that for you right now. Will you open your heart to him? Will you say, I receive you, Lord Jesus. I take your gift. I open my heart to you. I want you to come in right now. Would you do that right now? Just say to him, Lord Jesus, I'm, I'm asking you to become my Savior in this moment. Today is the day of salvation. Call on him. He knows who you are. You're not just a pretty face in this crowd. He knows who you are. He knows where you're sitting. He knows why you're in this church this morning on this day because he's planned to ask you, will you take my gift? Will you receive me into your life and let me change you forever? Would you bow your head, please? Quiet moment of prayer. I appreciate nobody looking about I'm not going to do what God doesn't do. I can't force you to pray that prayer, but I sure plead with you. As a friend, I beg of you, take that gift. You'll never regret it. It will change you forever. Start following Jesus. It's the smartest, best thing you will ever do. Now, Lord, I know that the need of our heart is great and only you can fill it and the Spirit can open eyes and hearts and he is right now and I thank you for that and I pray that the ones who need to be saved today in this service will say yes to the Son of God and then I pray that the rest of us will see who you are and worship you as the great God Almighty that you are. I pray in your name, amen.